Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, uh, everyone. This is really great facilities. Thank you to everybody who's helped out providing that. Uh, so this past week, uh, there was a really funny story that was relayed first to me by uh, a senior faculty member in our department, and then later by my wife. Uh, and it turns out that a senior faculty member in my department, his wife, her name is Ruth, and she is high school friends with Pam. And Pam, it turns out, is my mother-in-law's colleague. Okay, so I know both of these people, but they're not from the same community, right? These are entirely different worlds uh, of my life, right? One is kind of professional, the other one is personal, uh, and these women are, you know, probably six years old, seven years old maybe, and it turns out that they, they know each other. Right? That's really surprising, right, that there's a triangle like this, because we're not all in the same community together. Earlier today, uh, Peter and Caroline are two friends of mine who are here, and I thought that they would know each other, and so I introduced them to each other. We're all in the same community, and it's not surprising that at some point they would become friends, right, because we're all statisticians, we're all in this kind of data community. And what I'm going to talk about today is this, uh, the importance of triangles in detecting communities. How it's really surprising to see a triangle among nodes that are not in the same community, but entirely expected that you do see them in, in, for people in the same community. Um, and, and this is uh, what we'll call the blessing of transitivity. Before we get there, I'm going to be a little bit pedantic, and I apologize for that. Um, a step back even further back than networks and say that historically, I think the overriding academic achievement of statisticians is to provide a framework for making rigorous inferences uh, about the world. And so kind of a toy picture is that you have the world, there's some, something, some question that you have about the world that you would like to answer, so you do an experiment, you somehow collect data, and you get this raw data, right? This raw data is a simplification of the real world. Then you do some data analysis, you further simplify this raw data, you get some summary statistics, parameter estimates, visualizations, right? Another set of step of simplification. And at the end of the day, what we want to do is inference. What we want to do is say something about the world, right? So there's these two steps of simplification, and then we want to step up. And the only way that we can do this is with a statistical model. Uh, so George Box uh, uh, told us that all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And, and today what I want to talk about is trying to improve these models in, in the respect that has to deal with triangles. Um, so then, what does this mean about networks? How do we think about networks from this paradigm? I think that the network itself is a useful way of simplifying really complex interactions and a complex system of interactions. If you look at, for example, this network science network, it's a sim simple example that's in uh, Aleska Beck et al. paper. Each, each relationship here corresponds to a one or a zero, but is representing a really much more complex dynamic between these two researchers. And it's only represented as a one or a zero here. Um, but at the end of the day, what we hope to do is find communities or clusters in the network, and, and this suggests that we're making some inference to the data generating mechanism, that there's some latent structure in this mechanism that we can estimate and make inferences about. And so, with this, we can study algorithms under, under a model, right? This is something that uh, both Peters and, uh, and Patrick worked on or talked about earlier this morning. Well, so, so I know you know this, but yeah. you have something to say. So the subtitle of that paper in 2008 is you know, lack of communities, at least at a large scale. I'm absolutely going to talk about that. I'm absolutely going to talk. I can't remember if, it's, if I right. saved it for the end or if it's earlier, but right. definitely, Good. yes. And your name is there, don't worry. No, that's fine. <laughs> I, 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 I'm still waiting to get a statistical answer. I'm just waiting. <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> uh, so in 2008, oh, I should say that, uh, as, as you say, like these, these are kind of really simple pictures of really simple networks. And at a large scale, things are much more complicated. And Spielman and Tang in 2008, I think, have this really groundbreaking paper where they suggest local clustering algorithms for massive graphs um, and, and show how you can have a nearly linear time graph partitioning. So it's really fast, been an empirical success. It's what you guys used in your paper, I believe, or some uh, follow-up version of this algorithm. Um, and, and the current theory for that is that you get perturbation bounds on graph conductance and some running time guarantees for the algorithm. 
Um, and following that paper, there were a number of other uh, related results on this idea of local clustering. And the idea here is that you start off with a seed node, that there's somebody in the network that you're, you are interested in. Maybe you want to sell them an ad. Maybe it's a gene that you know is really important for some set of interactions. And, and then you want to find a, a cluster that's around that node. Okay? And in this talk, I want to try and provide a statistical framework for local clustering. And it's going to show that sparse and transitive stochastic block models or planned partition models, they naturally lead to local clustering. Second, I want to illustrate uh, how this blessing of transitivity, something that has to do with this over here and is related to this, um, makes small clusters, these local clusters, both easy, easy to estimate algorithmically and statistically. <coughs> and some of what I'm going to say is, is going to apply in the more general exchangeable random graph setting that the previous speakers have spoke about. But I think this kind of toy version of the model is, is a little bit easier to talk about. Uh, and it's, it's the planted partition model, um, where k is the number of blocks, this is the number of groups, s is the population of each block, so we assume that uh, we're conditioning on, on the latent variables, if you will, and each block has equal population s. R is the probability of an out-of-block connection, the probability that an edge crosses a boundary of a block. And P is the probability of an in-block connection. Okay, so just a sanity check. N, the number of nodes, is equal to K times S. And we're going, I'm going to assume that R, the uh, probability of an out-of-block connection, is less than P, just to make the communities that are kind of dense. And so here's a picture of the of a, an adjacency matrix from the more general stochastic block model. Of course, you don't see any structure. The aim is to estimate the partition such that you then see these blocks, right? And, and uh, so, so what we're trying to do here in this literature is estimate the partition of the nodes. Um, and this partition, I'm going to refer to it as Z. This, I think that this started in the IEEE community. Somebody's, uh, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong with that. Uh, maybe with McSherry's paper in 2001, Spectral Partitioning of Random Graphs, um, later in 2004, and there were kind of a trickle of papers after that. And then in the last four years, there's just been an explosion of this literature, um, which uh, uh, we've been a part of in, in some other, in other works, along with Peter Bickle <coughs> and uh, Patrick Wolf uh, and, and many others. So this is only a small subset of, of those papers where you have a stochastic block model, you sample it, you have some algorithm, and you want to show that you can estimate the partition. And if we think back to Peter's talk um, and Patrick's talk, I think that there are kind of two, or three, um, and, and even Andrea's talk earlier, there, there are kind of three quantities that regulate how difficult it is to estimate Z, the partition in this literature. First of all, there's edge sparsity, where more edges are better. Um, there's the size of the smallest cluster, bigger is better. And then there's the difference between this in-block and out-of-block probabilities, right? If this is too close together, then uh, it becomes exceedingly hard. If they're equal, then it's completely unidentifiable. And uh, when we're going to zoom into the local setting, and this story, it, it's kind of flipped around a little bit. Certainly, this uh, condition still holds, but it, we're in a regime where uh, the out-of-block probabilities, it turns out, they have to converge to zero, and the in-block probabilities have to stay bounded away from zero. It makes this, this part of it is just completely satisfied when you have sparse and uh, transitive models. And then these parts kind of get flipped on their heads as well. <coughs> okay, so that was a little bit of background on, the, on, on this, these issues. Now we'll get into the two main parts of the talk. Sparse and transitive models naturally lead to local clustering, where you have large P and vanishing R. And what I mean by local clusters are really small blocks, really small communities. They're not like a, uh, growing with the size of the communities, with the size of the entire network. So we've heard a lot about uh, sparsity graphs where the number of actual edges in a network is a very small fraction of the number of possible edges, right? And so the average node degree in most networks is maybe between 10 and 100, even in really massive graphs. Uh, and 
and, and moreover, this is something that we haven't really talked about today, most empirical networks, in, whether it's web or social, um, have many more triangles than we might otherwise expect. You, you get a lot of this type, this type of structure. And so we're going to want to make a model that has both of these features, right? Uh, and, and when we do that, well, I'll show you what happens. Um, so here's again transitivity. If, you have, if you're friends of friends, then it's very likely that you become friends, right? Same story over here where Peter and Caroline, um, I'm both friends with them, and so it's not surprising that at some point that they would meet, meet each other. And the transitivity ratio is one way of measuring this. It's proportional to the number of triangles, the number of these guys, divided by the number of two stars. <coughs> What's the definition of two stars? Uh, this guy. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? So under the planted partition model, where we're assuming that R is less than P, so in-block probabilities are higher than out-of-block probabilities, if P goes to zero, then you remove transitivity. Um, so since transitivity is something that we want in our network, we can't let P go to zero. And this holds more generally in the exchangeable random graph model, where if, if you're allowed to maximize over the latent variables, if that maximum probability, the maximum probability over all pairs of latent variables, if this thing goes to zero, you remove transitivity in your network. Um, and so you don't want these maximum probabilities to go to zero. This is kind of what happens when you do the, the um, dividing by row n or something like that. Um, anyway, so if, if p is bounded from below, then the block size cannot grow faster than the expected degree. So these two things, they're basically just kind of like accounting. They're not uh, so they're not so difficult, but I think that they're really informative in how we think about the types of models that we should consider and the asymptotic regimes that make sense to be most applicable to real data. Okay, so this is just saying saying what I said here. So. Um, So this is the first part of the blessing of transitivity. In the planted partition model, this model with four parameters, it's a type of stochastic block model, with bounded expected degree. So now, before we were talking about degree growing like log n, or faster than log n, or polynomial in n, here uh, we're just going to keep it bounded. Okay, so expected degree does not grow. Uh, transitivity <laughs> then implies that p, the in-block probability, is bounded below. r is of order 1 over n, and s this is the size of each block, remember. It's bounded. Okay, so you, can't, you don't get really big blocks. So think back to the, the previous results that have to do with global results, global clustering results where you have a, a stochastic block model and you want to estimate z. Uh, these re, uh, results require growing degrees and growing blocks. The size of each block needs to grow. And what we want to do here is study bounded degrees and bounded blocks. And the thing that makes this possible is that r is going to zero while p is staying fixed. So remember that third condition, how close these probabilities can come, uh, it gets dramatically wider asymptotically. Um, and so here's really the important part of this blessing is that it, it doesn't necessarily make the bad edges disappear. The out-of-block edges can still be common, order, order n. But out-of-block triangles are unlikely. These types of triangles right here between Ruth, Pam, and myself, this is the wife of a faculty member in my department, and this is my mother-in-law's friend, the probability that they're, they're friends is, of course, really unlikely. Um, and you don't see many triangles like this in, uh, in this in this model, in this planted partition model. On the other hand, in-block triangles are very common. Right? So triangles like this, where we're all statisticians, you see a lot of these things in this model. Uh, and so we look at triangles here for computational purposes, but you could look at four cliques and you might get slightly better rates here. So there's been a little bit of related research. So the asymptotic setting here is, it, is that you're not growing the size of each block and that's how you make your, your network grow. What you're actually doing is you're adding blocks to your adjacency matrix asymptotically. Your, your blocks are a fixed size and you're just adding blocks as you go down. And uh, so there's been some related research. Uh, we have a previous result where we kind of studied this, this version of the model. We, need, we needed block sizes to grow faster than log n. Um, <coughs> poly log n is fine. And uh, we used a restricted maximum likelihood estimator. Uh, Verzellen and uh, Arias Castro uh, more recently 
have framed this as a hypothesis testing question where you have a massive sparse erdos renyi graph near the Poisson limit, um, and there's a hidden block somewhere that's growing faster than log n. It's kind of a similar problem to what Andre is talking about. And I'm not, maybe your asymptotic setting applies here, and I should be citing it. Um, I, I need to check the citation. Um, but in this regime, the number of triangles is a, is a powerful test statistic. Okay, so here we, we kind of assume that every node is in a block, and here there's maybe one block, and you want to test whether there is one block that's very small. Okay, so here's, is this the plot that you wanted, Michael? Well, <coughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's what I was referring to. I want to know how the statistical method will map to that. Good, yeah. <laughs> okay. So empirical networks contain small communities, right? So I just kind of said if you have transitivity and sparsity under this model, then you get small communities. And kind of it's, it's satisfying that we actually see this in, in real networks where I... Uh, uh, Leskovic, Lang, Dasgupta, and Mahoney uh, in 2008, they kind, of, they kind of have this tour de force where they look at all of these sorts of networks, and uh, the communities with the smallest conductance are no larger than 100 nodes, even in really big graphs. So you always get these nice, tight clusters. And um, I think that transitivity, <coughs> what, what the previous slide suggests, is that transitivity plays a key role in this, and we should use the triangles to try and discover these local clusters. This relates to uh, some work of Sahesh, who's here somewhere, uh, where they have more perturbation results where they try and break up a graph, or they show that you can break up a graph into, uh, into dense re uh, regions with dense triangles. So does the model that you're describing, I mean, is, does it have enough randomness that it's going to be an expander at large size scales? Or does it damage the local structure on that plot? Or how does it relate to this plot, do you know? Uh, so it doesn't have the properties that you want. Uh, but that was just a toy model. What I'm actually going to suggest is actually, maybe it might actually be a little bit more satisfying. Um, uh, and we'll do that in the second part here. Okay, five minutes. Transitivity makes these uh, small clusters easy to estimate, both statistically and algorithmically. And we're going to study this under a semi-parametric model, and I'll explain what that means. So we started off talking about local algorithms, and we forgot forgot local algorithms, we use stochastic block model sparsity and transitivity to get a model with small blocks, right? And in the last section, we're going to combine these two threads. We're going to propose a local clustering algorithm that looks for triangles. And then we're going to study the estimation performance of this algorithm under a local stochastic block model that has a semi-parametric, uh, that allows, basically, you have a, a local block that we're assuming is a block model. And then you have a hairball of a network down there. And you let the hairball of the network grow to infinity, and, uh, and your block stays fixed. That's kind of the um, picture that we have. So I said that we're going to study local algorithms. Uh, in fact, there's a global version of our algorithm, which is easier to state, I think, uh, than the local version. And uh, this finds it for all seed nodes with all <laughs> tuning parameters. There's one tuning parameter. Um, so to find, uh, this is maybe referred to as the regularized graph Laplacian. And uh, so it, you could think of it like the adjacency matrix at first, if you like. And you compute, uh, if this is the adjacency matrix, A times A, matrix multiplied, element-wise, product times A. And so what this is, if it's A, is the number of triangles that contain edge IJ. Uh, and so you could think of this as a weighted graph, and you run single linkage hierarchical clustering on it. You find the maximum spanning tree, which for the statisticians in the room, if you can ever phrase your problem as a maximum spanning tree, do it, because it's so fast. This algorithm is so lightning fast. Thank you to the computer scientists in the room that make that so fast. Uh, uh, and so this thing, as I said, is called the regularized graph Laplacian. It was proposed uh, by uh, these authors in 2012. Um, Amini Chen, and Levina had a similar version, uh, very similar, though. Uh, and if you're interested in how to choose tuning parameter tau, we have a NIPS paper uh, which suggests that the average degree is, is kind of a, we have some analytical results which suggest that's kind of a good thing. Okay, so the local version of the algorithm, here's, here's a quick go at it. Um, and we're going to do it in a really simplified case where we're going to initialize uh, with Jennifer, she's our seed node, and what you do is you look at all of Jennifer's friendships, or all the friendships that cross the edge boundary, and you say, is this edge in a triangle? So this one is not in a triangle. This one, the Edo is, right? And so, uh, and all of these other ones are in triangles. So in the next step, you add uh, any edge that, uh, that's in this triangle, so you get this block. And you iterate again, where you look at all of the edges coming from these people, and you stop when you have no edges that leave the cluster that are in a triangle. Okay? That's kind of the simple version of the algorithm 
you can make the number of necessary triangles kind of a tuning parameter. And with the graph Laplacian, you make it uh, you weight them, weight the degrees of the nodes, which is kind of a nice thing. Okay. This is what I just said. Okay. So now we want to study the performance of this algorithm under a statistical model. And since the local version of this algorithm, it only searches locally, right? We search from Jennifer and then we just go out. We only need a local model. That is, we only as assume something stochastic around Jennifer, and then there's the people in her community that is still stochastic, but then everything else in the network, we might not need to assume so much, right? So there's three pieces of the network. There's the seed node and its local block, and then there's the, the, the rest of the network, which is just some giant hairball. And we're not going to make any parametric assumptions, no degree distribution, no maximum degree assumptions. This can be whatever you want as long as it's sparse and independent of the relationships that go between the local block and the hairball. Okay, so this is, is it fair to call this a semi-parametric? Maybe. <laughs> not so satisfying, maybe. Okay. The point is that we don't need to assume that this is, say, Erdos Rennie or anything like that. The price you pay, of course, is that you start off with a node that's in, in the block, right? That there's a node that you're particularly interested in. So then there's two versions of this model. The first one is not degree corrected. The second one is. Uh, and you can use the adjacency matrix when it's not degree corrected, but you need to use L, the Laplacian, when it is degree corrected. And this version works a whole lot better in practice. You use the graph Laplacian, the regularized graph Laplacian. Um, so if, it, if, the, if you have the correct seeding and the ambient graph, this, this, this hairball of a network uh, is sparse, then the local algorithm returns the cluster with high probability but it doesn't require growing degrees, right? Before you needed growing degrees, we don't need that. In fact, that's kind of a bad thing. Uh, and you don't need growing S, right? So we're in the fixed block case that we want to be in. Uh, we don't require a specific model on this hairball of a network, most of what's going on. Um, and uh, we don't require a bounded degree in this hairball. Okay, sorry to say that so, so many times, but I think that that's really important. And, and what happens here is, uh, so this term, is the probability that your, your greedy algorithm is going to slip outside your block, that you're somehow going to include some node that's, that's in the hairball. Okay, in this term, it goes to zero. And then this term explains, uh, is just the probability that you get everybody in your cluster, right? that you get everybody in the block. This term does not go to zero or one, however you state it. Uh, there's just bad things that can happen because the block is not growing. Right? There could be no edges in there, and that probability does not converge to zero. So this can't go to, go to one. Um, and be perfectly consistent. But, but the slipping outside does, does fall away. So, sorry, what do, what do you mean by sparse if you don't have bounded degree? The average degree is uh, constant or doesn't grow within. Or it can grow within, but it's, it's a tuning prime. It's lambda, and it appears right there. Okay. What, what's little s there? S is the size of the, the block. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, so we don't assume that the size of the local cluster grows. S is fixed. You could make it grow, and then this would, this would go to 1. You don't need it. Any other questions? Okay, so here's with the graph Laplacian in the degree corrected version. In the degree corrected version, the probability of, of crossing the boundary from your local block to the hairball is proportional to a node's degree in the hairball. So really high degree nodes in the hairball are more likely to attract edges. Uh, yeah, tau. so this is just the regular uh, regularized graph Laplacian from. The the also tau computer slide. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so we have not compared this to any other algorithms, but it, it does give some reasonable results on not huge networks, but fairly large networks. And you can do this. I did this on my Mac Air, really small computer. In R, it's really fast to do the global version. Um, and so these next plots. I want to uh, show the induced subgraph of some of these local clusters. When I first made this plot, I was really kind of shocked. Like, I didn't know what to expect, but I'm used to looking at hairballs of networks that you can't really understand what's going on. And the point here, when you plot these things locally, right, so these, to be sure that these nodes come from a 70,000 node network. I'm only plotting a very small part of it. 
but you can actually kind of tell a story about what's going on. And so getting to Jennifer's point about validation. Sorry, one, one. Yes, please. So you ran this algorithm from all vertices, or you ran it from one node <coughs> and then picked another vertex? So, so I ran the global version where you run it on all seed nodes with all tuning parameters, and then I just kind of took some of the nice ones. Um, but you can, if, if, if this was a scientific application and you're really interested in this cluster for some particular reason, you can actually plot it. And, and as statisticians, these visualizations in, for example, regression are a really big part of validation. Right? That's how we kind of validate our linear model assumptions is by visualization. And we're starting to get to a regime where you can actually plot these things and understand them because we're looking at local clustering, because we're looking at small communities. Here's kind of a weird example, right? Maybe nodes nine and three are kind of weird in this. We could look at them further. Uh, Do you know if, the, if you color coded that by degree in the full graph, mm -hmm. does the local procedure you're running bias yourself towards high degree nodes like a diffusion would, or does it keep you itself locally so it be not, you don't tend to bias yourself towards very high degree nodes? So that's why you, we have to do the uh, regularized graph Laplacian. The graph Laplacian kind of downweights it. There might still be some bias in the end, but that's why you really need that. Otherwise, it just everything goes haywire. Yeah. Okay, so here's a less transitive graph. Okay, time's up. So, uh, local clustering is justified for several reasons, uh, and and I think that one of the really big parts of local clustering is that it's answering a new type of question. We're not interested in making um, a partition of our entire huge billion-node network, right? You're interested in one one page. You're interested in one user, and and that really local clustering really speaks to that. Um, and there's empirical evidence for these small communities. Computation, visualization, interpretation, diagnostics, they all improve. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, finally, the blessing of transitivity, this idea that you have triangles in clusters but are very unlikely outside of clusters, um, allows for these fast algorithms and, and semi-parametric results in networks.